Welcome uh, to my presentation. I'm Victor Bertranson Erlandsen from the Montana University in the Open in Austria. And I will uh, be presenting and discussing some of my PhD results uh, concerning trace elements uh, and the, the applications that you can basically use trace elements for when constraining or forming processes and so on. Uh, uh, based on my Namibian sediment hosted copper cobalt deposit of my PhD research. It, this is uh, together with the Gecko Namibia, an exploration company that supplied us with drill cores and uh, help in the field. But first of all, why do we care about trace elements? Uh, I think first of all, we need, of course, to signify the cobalt, uh, not a trace element in this case, but uh, the reason for this, the interest in this occurrence uh, for green uh, transition and uh, electrical batteries and so on. But furthermore, sulfides deposits just such as this one uh, and deposits in general can contain significant amounts of gallium, germanium, indium, and other critical raw elements materials. Uh, and basically, if these trace elements are hopefully not even the trace elements, but these critical raw materials uh, occur in high enough uh, concentrations in the ore, the whole economic value of the ore might be increased. And we've seen this in uh, some of my work I've done together with a colleague on the Kupischiffer, a sediment hosted copper in Poland. We see uh, some very nice uh, germanium and indium values. Uh, but furthermore, uh, I think a lot of uh, projects are being started right now, basically focusing at least here in Europe on either revisiting old mines or even occurrences that weren't economic first and reevaluating them based on the co uh, composition or uh, component of critical elements uh, in them. But what I will also focus more on this uh, in this presentation is the genetic interpretation that we can do from trace element data uh, to constrain, for example, formation conditions. My deposit or mineralization is the Dollison ore formation in Northwestern uh, Namibia. It's uh, located right here in the Kauko belt, which is the northern branch of the Damaran orogenic uh, belt. And it's more or less a uh, anomaly or enrichment in copper, cobalt, zinc, nickel, iron, and magnesium. Uh, and was first explored already in 2013, so not too far long ago. So it was it's pretty uh, new. As I said, situated in the Kauko belt of the Damarna origin, a host of neo calcareous siltstones mostly, siltstones, dolomites, even some anchorites. So it's a very iron rich system, basically. That's what we're working with in the Damarna supergroup. And this whole, both the setting and the sediments are coeval and basically an analog to the center mountain copper belt, where we get our cobalt from. Um, and it's good because there has not really been much work done on this mineralization or in this area, really, to be honest. Uh, so we kind of use the center of the copper belt as kind of a reference and uh, analog to work with. And the mineralization styles that we've been um, analyzing of the, of the DOF deposit in general, we have the disseminations, usually monosulfides uh, disseminated within the host rock bit coarser, as you can see, some and some are more fine-grained. We have clusters, uh, usually occurring with polysulfides. So a lot of sulfides, uh, pyrites and sphalerites, you'll see this as well. But also within the host rock, we have nodules, uh, partially mineralized and uh, sometimes completely mineralized. The so-called sigma, as I've uh, just briefly called it or named it, um, and it's First, when we did the drill core logging, we, we would did consider this being a nodule, but when we actually make sections, you see nice pressure shadows and pressure wings, basically, like a sigma class. We have a lot of veins, where quartz carbonate dominated, quartz dominated, sulfide, veinlets, veins, uh, throughout the stratigraphy, of course, as well, but it's a major uh, component. And then we have these the last type of mineralization style, which are these so-called events. 
Uh, the company interpreted them first as being slump structures due to their ductile uh, appearance, as they do have a ductile component, but also some brittle. These are pretty enigmatic still, and we do not really understand uh, what they are. If they're primary, secondary, uh, if they relate to immunization, as they are also found um, in the stratigraphy unmineralized. I have been wondering if these are some type of perhaps crack seal veins, but we're still working on uh, really understanding these. So the sulfites we have in this uh, mineralization is uh, sphalerite, chalco, pyrite, linaeite, which is the major cobalt sulfide, pyrite and pyrotite, and then some accessory galena and cobaltite. And uh, sphalerite, chalco, pyrite, and pyrotite are the ones that I've been focusing on with the laser ablation ICPMS. And this is basically what it looks like. Here we see one of these clusters, mineralization styles, uh, where we have the linaeite being surrounded in a matrix of pyrite with some interstitially grown chalcopyrite and sphalerite. And then here we see the black craters, beautiful round craters from the laser ablation ICPMS. So let's look at some geochemistry. Here we have sphalerite geochemistry of uh, four selected elements. Uh, they are here split up according to the, the mineralization styles as that we looked through. And I hope you agree with me that you can basically see a trend of the green and oil, uh, purple one, the sigma and the veins clustering together. And as, if not together, at least separated from the rest, which are the disseminations, the clusters, the nodules, and the events. And as you can see, they're not always that one group of uh, mineralization styles are enriched compared to the other, but they are enriched and, and depleted uh, relatively to each other, and it varies which one is the, the, the more enriched uh, group, so to say. But I think you can agree that there seems to be a nice grouping, at least. And the same is seen in chalcopyrite. I mean, now I'm just showing a few of the elements, but this rings true for more elements uh, that we've been analyzing. And in some elements, of course, we don't see any grouping and they can be completely scattered. Uh, but I, we see this in several of the, many of the elements for both sphalerite and chalcopyrite. And I mean, it, it looks very clean and nice grouping basically. When it comes to pyrite, it is not as clear. I have only shown two here uh, because basically there is not much to say with the grouping. Perhaps the only thing you can say is that there's cluster nodules grouping together. This is probably the only real trend we can see. Uh, do note that there is no dissemination in this um, of pyrite. Disseminated pyrite do occur outside the war horizons in the host rock as framboidal pyrite and also euhedral, probably metamorphic pyrite, but not within the main war horizon. So one of the nice things that you can do with trace elements for a lot of uh, minerals is you can plot them in all these different kinds of plot and you can discriminate where the origins of the fluids or the ore forming processes come from. Uh, this might be one of the first examples from Campbell and Ethier on the pyrite and pyrotite, where you plot nickel and cobalt to see basically if it's magmatic, uh, sedimentary or volcanic. And I think this one signifies and really shows my problem that my data really plots in the middle of nowhere uh, for basically all of them, all of these uh, discrimination of plots that have been uh, produced. Uh, it, of course, Campiel and Ethier already uh, pointed out that when you are in a uh, area or metallogenic region, which is cobalt or nickel rich, this plot actually doesn't work. So uh, for even from the start, uh, we already can say that this one doesn't work, but it really shows that we just plot out of nowhere. And this rings true for a lot of, uh, or basically all of discrimination plots that I've tried to apply, which is very sad because this is one of the great things that you, you can really do with uh, trace limit theta. But Fritz Ledal 2016 uh, published uh, these calculations to use the GGIMF in Svalbard geothermometer, which is uh, germanium, gallium, indium, manganese, manganese and iron composition of uh, sphalerite to calculate the formation temperatures, which I did here. And I mean, you, we can see that it's somewhere between three, maybe 320 up to 
410 almost. Uh, not, not too bad, it's a big spread, but unfortunately this whole system has a closing temperature of uh, 310 plus minus 50, really showing that we can't even use this one either. Uh, all we can say that these file rights uh, from all mineralization styles formed above this 310 plus minus 50. So what does all of this uh, non-data or uh, really add up to? Well, I do think that you can really see a grouping of the mineralization styles, and I hope you guys agree, at least for the Svalorin and Chalco pyrite. Um, and I think this really shows that trace elements can also be applied to kind of suggest or indicate generations that, you know, if they have a, so, such a similar uh, signature in the trace elements, it is, I argue, very plausible. They form during the same event or mineralization stage. And this is something that you know traditional or conventional uh, paragenet paragenetic investigations using microscopes really can't prove. Uh, we, when we compare in the events, uh, we have pyrite and uh, coexist in pyrotite. And basically we see uh, elements such as copper, arsenic and lead being depleted, uh, while cobalt, nickel and selenium is uh, basically remains the same. And this is a typical thing for uh, metamorphic in green schist and fibrolite facies pyrite, where pyrite will liberate copper and lead and such, uh, and these will form other phases, which we see with the sphalerite and charcoal pyrite, while cobalt nickel selenium, which is tightly bound within the matrix or the crystal lattice, uh, remain in the iron sulfides. The sphalerite also, I mean, really shows we have a higher temperature, so 310 at least. And I think all of this really shows that we have a metamorphic overprint or affinity of the uh, mineralization. And the grouping shows it's a multi-stage origin. And I kind of suggest that we may, we have these primary pyrites, green schist facies uh, is happening, the liberating lead and zinc, uh, and copper producing this charcoal pyrite sphalerite. Um, the recrystallites iron sulfides still remain with their cobalt and nickel and selenium, which we see. Uh, but of course, these uh, sedimentals of the coppers are very, uh, a lot of people want to see them as early diagenetic or such. And of course, we can't really prove that there is not, uh, if it's been metamorphically overprinted. As I said, there is framboidal pyrite and uh, metamorphic pyrite in the host rock as well. As well. And this is something I want to investigate for the future. And that was uh, everything for me. Thank you very much.